Uh, my name is Reverend John Dim. I'm a Frontier Service Remote Area Minister. I live in Tom Price, which is 1,600 kilometres north of Perth. And 99% of my work is done in, with the mining company Rio Tinto, uh, looking after the people in camps. The rest of the work I do with stations and the normal remote area ministry work with um, people up around the 80 mile beach and further up nearly to Broome. I was born a Catholic, into a Catholic family, an Irish Catholic family, and I guess I didn't have any other choice but to be a Catholic and a Christian. But as I've got older, I've found my own faith, I've found my own niche, and um, I guess one could say I'm a very liberal Catholic now. Remote, remote area ministry is what John Flynn did. John Flynn found the AIM, Australian Inland Mission, about 100 years ago, 102 years ago to be exact. And he went out and he went amongst the station people in South Australia, right up into Alice Springs, right through into the Northern Territory. And he set up little congregations as he went. And we have followed in his footsteps since. My first appointment with Frontier Services was to Hawker in South Australia, where I said I would go for five years and stayed for 10 years. And I remember very well the day I arrived in Hawker. It was a day like today, nice and warm and hot. And the people gathered around and welcomed us. And there was a bunch of flowers there for my wife. And there was a cooked meal in the oven for us. It was just that good Christian feeling. And from then on, we just loved the place. We loved the people. And we didn't go to the stations and we didn't say to the station people, are you Catholic, are you Knighting, are you Anglican? We just said, what can we do to help you? Because when we went to Hawker in 2003, they were in the biggest drought that they have ever had. Men shooting sheep. Men shooting cattle. I remember sitting in a cattle yard with one chap who had a shotgun and he was going to kill himself because he felt he was a failure to his wife and his two children because he had to shoot his cattle. He had no feed for them. Anyway, to make a long story very short, he and I and her and the kids have become very great friends. I did one of their kids' weddings not long ago, actually, and um, baptised their new grandchild. And he has always thanked me for that day, took him out of doing himself in. But it was the way that God works through us. There's a beautiful peace prayer by Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Those two lines are so important for us Christians. We, we, we have a lot of challenges in remote area ministry. The biggest challenge we have is finance, is to keep us there. It costs $100,000 a year to keep a remote area minister in his placement. You have a car, a house, a stipend. Fuel is my biggest. Fuel is my biggest expense. I would travel about five, six thousand kilometres per month. So fuel is a big expense. I'm very lucky out on the mine site where they take up a, a raffle or they have a collection and they, and they don't mo donate money to us to help us out, which is great, which is great. But I... Um, also, you don't know who you're dealing with out there. The challenge is you cannot go into a mine site and preach the gospel. You cannot go into the mine site with the Bible tucked under your arm because the mining companies won't allow it. So you go in more or less as a counsellor to them. And once they get to know you and once they get to trust you, then you can bring a little bit of the Bible into it. When I go out to the mine sites now, one night a week we have a church service. We have it between 5.30 and 6 o'clock. Half an hour they have because they must get to the bar by 6 o'clock. So they give us a half an hour. And I, I get about 10, 15 people come to it. We, we break bread together. We celebrate the sacrament together. And it is so lovely to do that. But we don't beat a drum about it. We don't go out and say, hey, church is on at half past five. Come in here and do it. We do it nice and quietly. And how that came about was after the first suicide that we had, 
We had 350, 400 people standing around in a quad wrangle. And the mine manager was addressing them and he said, I don't know where to go from here, I don't know what to do, but we'll ask Reverend, what will we do? And I said to him, let's just be with each other. Let's just celebrate so-and-so's life. Let's not think of the dark past that he had. Let's not think why this has happened. Let's celebrate his life. Then I turned around to the mine manager and I said to him, so-and-so, would you mind if we recited the Lord's Prayer together? And he goes, no, Rev, whatever you want to do. And we recited the Lord's Prayer. And it's amazing, the Lord's Prayer only takes about 30, 40 seconds to say, but in that 30 or 40 seconds, it gives me the opportunity to see who's Christian and who's not. The Christians will bow their heads, the Catholics will put their arms up like that, the other people will stand there like that, and it gives me an idea of the sort of congregation that you are looking at. One story that sticks out in my mind is this. I won't identify where the station is because it would identify the person. The person was a 25-year-old nurse in Sydney who met her husband-to-be at a bush dance in Sydney. They fell in love, boy meets girl, girl meets boy, fell in love, and he took her back to the outback. Here's this very highly educated woman going to the outback. And he took her home to a house where his parents still lived. His father was still the boss. His mother was still the boss. And they were put into the cottage down the track a little bit. And the first night there, I remember her telling me, the father sat at the head of the table and she was chatting on to the mother-in-law and she was chatting on to the others around there. And the father put his hand up like that. And he goes, excuse me, you will speak when I speak to you. You will not speak otherwise. That was the start of her married life. After 10 years, the father and Lord died, God rest his soul, and they looked after the mother. After a few years, the mother in law died, God rest her soul, and they moved into the main house with their children. After about 17, 18 years of marriage, her husband was killed in a light plane crash mustering cattle. She had no idea what the books were like. She had no idea of the operation of the station. She had no idea of operation with the bank. And I remember going up there and I did the funeral and I met her and I met the family and I, I got to know him very, very well before he died. So it was just a natural progression that I became involved. <coughs> and I remember after a few days being up there, she came to me and she threw the books. We were sitting outside on the veranda and she threw the books down on the table. And she said, I've got nothing, absolutely nothing. We're in that much debt. So she cried. I let her cry for a little while. And then I said to her, You've got a choice of two things here. You either pack up with your kids and you go back to Sydney and start a new life again. But to do that, you have to retrain as a nurse. Or you can stay here, pick up the pieces and go again. So she slept on it. And the next day she came out to me at breakfast and she said to me, Reverend John, I'm going to pick up the pieces here and go again. That station today is one of the best stations in the area. She has what's called Wang Nu beef, which sells for about $22 a kilo. And she breeds these beautiful cattle. She has money in the bank. She owes no one nothing. The station is debt free. The kids are all being educated. Her eldest son just got married. I had the privilege of doing his wedding. I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago baptising her first grandchild. And to stand there at that wedding and to baptise the grandchild afterwards and to see the smile on her face and the contentment that she had achieved what she was set out to achieve was something that I'll never forget. So there again, I say, we can achieve anything that we want to achieve 
providing we put our shoulder to the wheel and providing we believe in ourselves and believe in our faith. I've shed many a tear over different things in ministry. I stood beside a bed of a 12-year-old boy who was dying of cancer and he told his mother and father not to cry because he'd be in a better place shortly. And he turned around and told me, thank you, Reverend John, for getting me an Xbox to play with. An Xbox, a simple little toy. And here's this boy going to meet his maker, thanking me for doing it for him. How humbling. How humbling is that? And this is what this ministry is all about. It's about connections. It's about connecting with people. It's about being with people. And it's about walking with people. Always remember, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus was a walker. Jesus never had a congregation. And Jesus was a listener. And Jesus today is still a listener. How do you pray? You don't need a book to pray with. Talk to him. Talk to Jesus the way you and I talk. Thank him for the goodness that he gives us. Take him to task about stuff that you want to take him to task about. But always thank him for the day that we've had. Whether it's a good day or a bad day, thank him for the day we've had before we shut our eyes for that final sleep of the night time. 